Hello, my name is Ted and I serve as the Director of Operations for Reconciliation Church. I want to thank you for joining us as we meet online for the remainder of January. If you're new with us, as a church, we reflect the diversity that all followers of Christ will experience one day in heaven. We do that by making disciples of all people, starting in Nightdale, throughout the rest of the triangle, and then to the rest of the earth. If you'd like to give to the work that we're doing, there's two easy ways that you can give. You can text any dollar amount to 84321, or you can go to reconciliationrdu.com and click give. Thanks for joining us. Hello everyone. This is Pastor Russell Lee, pastor of Reconciliation Church. Before we get into the sermon this morning, I want to encourage everyone who's watching this, if you want to get any update on what's taking place with us during the month of January, please go to our website or look on our social media pages. You will be updated on things that will be pertinent for you to connect with us during this time. Now, we're going to continue today in our series we're calling We Are Reconciliation Church as we walk through our values. And the first value we're going to look at is the value of being gospel-centered. And today our text is going to come from um, Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. God's word says this. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. After they had Peter and John stand before them, they began to question them. By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by this man, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other, other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Before going further, let's pray. Father, this week has been a heavy week. Our days could be heavy. Life can seem chaotic. But Lord, we come to you in your word trusting you, knowing that you are in control and that you are working all things out after the counsel of your will. And so this morning, Lord God, as we open your word, as we uh, look to see and understand the truth of your word, I pray, Lord, that you would glorify your name in the preaching of your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Electricity is good. Through electricity, we're able to warm ourselves. Through electricity, we're able to cook, and through electricity, we're able to see because of lights. However, it would be a bad idea for us to take a screwdriver and to insert it into an electrical outlet because the same electricity that's used for our benefit can fry us. The same electricity used that will allow us to see will kill us. See, it can light up a room, uh, but we have to come to it rightly. Now, electricity is good, but it must be handled properly or else it will hurt us. My friends, God wants to guide and govern your life. But in order for this to happen, he has to be handled rightly. In order for us to know who God is, we must come to him in his word as he has revealed himself. You notice in scripture, God often says, fear me, fear me. Now, it's here that I recognize that this week, all of us have seen what has taken place this week. To me, it is obvious that there are many people 
who refuse to fear God as he has revealed himself in his word. And I don't want to look to other people. I even want to look at myself, right? Fear God. But right now it seems that we are not fearing God, even in the church. Uh, Pastor Brian Loritz made a statement in a sermon before where he says, we've done a great job of resurrecting what Jesus died to tear down, which is the dividing wall of hostility. We've seen this past week that we are great at hating one another. Uh, we, 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 we are good at, at just spewing great vitriol towards other people. Not only that, the God that we say that we worship is not the true God at all. Instead of worshiping God as he has revealed himself in scripture, we're worshiping politics and call it the Christian way. This is a great problem for the church and for society. And I've been noticing this term, this phrase used to describe what has taken place in this Christian nationalism. Pastor Jerome Gay defines Christian nationalism as an ideology that allows politics to eclipse the gospel in favor of political leanings and conservative values at the expense of biblical truth. Christian nationalists, um, they replace uh, the great commandment that what Jesus said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and love neighbor as yourself. But Christian nationalists replace that with love your country with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as long as they agree with you. But this is not the way of Jesus. This is not what he died for. In our text this morning, we're going to come to a section of scripture where uh, two of the apostles, Peter and John, were before the government of Israel, the Sanhedrin. Uh, who cared more about their way of life and their power than the power of God that was on display through the apostles, where people's lives were being changed. The, 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 the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, they wanted to examine Peter and John about what they were preaching because the power of God was on full display in healing a lame man in Acts chapter 3. They saw this. Thousands of people were trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the religious leaders did not like this. They did not like that this message of Jesus Christ and him crucified and him raised from the dead would transform the lives of thousands of people who would come to trust in the Lord Jesus. So they didn't want that message preached, but the apostles, praise God, they continue to preach the gospel. So what is the gospel? We need to define it. And I'm going to use a definition from the book, Gospel Haman Note. In that book, they define the gospel as liberation from all forms of oppression and sin through faith in Christ. Notice that word, liberation. I'm going to use that strategically because that's not a Marxist word. This is a biblical term. Liberation from all forms of oppression and sin through faith in Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives us salvation. It gives us salvation, the communion of human beings with God and with each other. It embraces all forms of human reality, transforms it, and leads it to fullness in Christ. Now, the question is, what is the purpose of God saving people? Why save people? Scripture lets us know. God saves so that the people he has rescued will worship him. We see this in Exodus chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Here it says, But Pharaoh responded, Who is this Lord that I should obey him by letting Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. They answered, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go on a three-day trip into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God or else he may strike us with plague or sword. Notice that it says sacrifice to the Lord our God. This means to worship. So the purpose for God delivering and rescuing the children of Israel was so that they could worship the true and living God. And the same is true for you and I today. So as we look at this text, our main point is this. 
Every human being must call on the name God has provided. Every human being must call on the name that God has provided for salvation. And what is that name? The name of Mashiach Yeshua or Jesus Christ. Salvation only comes through Jesus, whom the Father raised from the dead, and now he's seated at his right hand as ruler and savior. So when a person comes to, to the Lord Jesus Christ by, through repentance and faith, that person is saved, Romans 10 tells us. We are not saved by being Americans. We are not saved because of our ethnicity or culture or race. We are saved through Jesus and Jesus alone. The gospel of Jesus Christ is exclusive. There is no other way to be saved. Jesus would say in John 10 that he is the door. He is the doorway. The way to be saved is a narrow way and that comes only through Jesus. It's exclusive. But the gospel is also universal in its appeal. That means any person can come to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning, I want us to look at the text and look at these things. The first thing I want us to see is that the gospel means liberation. The gospel means liberation. And I want to use as a text, Acts chapter 3, verse 16. Next, I want us to see that Jesus is the only means for a person's salvation. We'll see that in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Jesus is the only means for salvation. And finally, I want us to see that Jesus was put to death unjustly, but God reversed the verdict. How did he do it? By raising Jesus from the dead. So let's look at the gospel, theological orthodoxy, or right belief. Let's look at our first point that the gospel means liberation. In Acts chapter 3, verse 16, it says, By faith in his name, his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given him this perfect health in front of all of you. As we will discuss more on next week, the theological and social aspects of the gospel go together. Both the theological and the social, they go together. But the issue that we tend to see in our day is we elevate one over the other. So for those who want to measure on the theological aspects of it, we just want to give divine truths. We want to just focus on saving souls. But then there's the other side where some people only want to focus on the social aspects or the liberation of the poor and the marginalized. So do they go together? I want to let you know that both of them go together. Scripture does not separate the theological nor the social aspects of the gospel. And we'll look at the, the social aspects of the gospel next week. Peter and John were placed before the religious leaders, the government. For what purpose? See, the government want, wanted to discredit Peter and John publicly. They wanted to smash their message, do away with it. Why? Because in chapter 3, a lame man, and scripture says this man was over 40 years old. For over 40 years, this man was lame. But when he encountered the gospel of Jesus Christ, this man was made whole. And they proclaimed Jesus crucified and raised uh, from the dead. By proclaiming the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the apostles, this is what they did, they publicly dishonored the religious leaders. They publicly dishonored the government. Uh, because in this society, honor was a high value. But Peter and, J and John, in proclaiming this, uh, they were dishonoring them. Because when the elite were faced with what they did in crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah, when they see this capital case that they were wrong, shame would come on them for their incompetence. But why am I using the word liberation? Why? Because in verses 5 through 12 of chapter 4, the word for saved, the Greek word for saved is used in verse 12, and it is also used in verse 9. Uh, the words that we read, saved and healed. And both of these words speak to spiritual and physical salvation, deliverance, or wholeness. 
You see, Jesus saved this man from his sickness, from him being lame. But he also saved him. He, he saved him from his sin. You see, his sickness was that he was disabled in his legs or feet. But in Jesus, this man was made whole. His life, his, the holistic nature of his life, he was liberated. He trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Acts chapter 2, Peter and many others were filled with the Spirit. Jesus had told them that the Spirit would come on them in Acts chapter 1. Jesus also told them that they would be witnesses to the ends of the earth, empowered by the Spirit. And when they received the Spirit, we see in the book of Acts that Peter and other apostles had no problem proclaiming this gospel that brings libera liberation, that brings salvation. Notice in the Old Testament, God sent Moses to Pharaoh. And Moses goes to Pharaoh with the message that God had given him in the power of God to let Pharaoh know that he needed to let his people go. In like manner, Peter, filled with the Spirit, had no problem proclaiming before these religious leaders the government, this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When a husband is married, it would be weird and it would be wrong for this man not to want to let other people know that he has taken a wife. It would be odd if the husband then said to his wife, I'll have dinner with you as long as it's at home. Or if he says to her, I'll watch a movie with you as long as it's at home. That would be an insult. In like manner, Jesus Christ is insulted regularly by his children because we want to identify with him in private, but in public, we don't want to let people know this is who we are, that we're in relationship with him. So like Peter, if we're not ashamed, as Paul says, Romans 1 16, if we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we go and proclaim it. Why do we proclaim the gospel? Why do we do this? We open our mouths and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ because people are lost. We are around lost people all the time. But what hinders us? What hinders us from sharing our faith and sharing the gospel with those who are lost? I believe it's fear. I believe fear can be one of the things that hinders us. But how can we combat that fear? If we remember Jesus when he sent the disciples out on mission, he sent them out in twos. I believe that one of the ways we can combat fear is having another believer with us. Because some of us, we, just, we may just be paralyzed to share our faith with people because we don't know if we're going to say all the right things, if we're going to be rejected. But often when my wife and I are in the, in the restaurants and maybe you've been with us and this has happened, uh, we like to play off of each other because we do know, yes, we're a husband and wife, but we're also on mission together. We are to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to all that we come in contact with. And my wife would ask a question and I would play off of her. But we're able to do this because we realize we're together in this. So I believe that a great way for us to combat fear is to, if we have an opportunity to go out and share our faith with someone who is in the faith. There's another thing that should motivate us as we open our mouths, and that is love. We need to be motivated by love for people. And we don't go and share our faith and check off a box like it's a duty, like mm, I've done that. But no, we should look at people the way that God sees them and that he loves them. And that should propel us to open our mouths and share the gospel. But in all of this, like Peter, we need the spirit of God because we cannot do this work that God has called us to in our own human strength. We need the power of the spirit of God. Notice that it said that Peter was filled with the spirit when he began to speak. Yes, Peter received the Spirit in Acts chapter 2. All who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of them. But we are also empowered by the Spirit to do work. 
And so we continue to need this filling and Peter was filled and we need to be filled. We are filled when we go out in the power of the spirit to proclaim this gospel that brings liberation. So the gospel means liberation. Secondly, I want us to see that Jesus is the only means for a person's salvation. Verse 12 it says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. My friends, Peter was unintimidated to stand before this political power structure. Unintimidated. Because he says that you, religious leaders in all Israel, need to hear this message today. Now, if we go back to Acts chapter 3, we would see what happened to this lame man was a, was a benefaction. It was a gift to this lame man. It was a loving act. But the religious leaders were offended by what happened. They actually saw what Peter and John did as a crime. So Peter, in his speech, he, he challenged his accusers and told them that they crucified their Messiah. So they put Peter and John on trial. They put them on trial. But instead of them being put on trial, Peter flips it and he puts them on trial. Now, this was bold by Peter, an act of boldness because he was filled with the spirit. So Peter tells the religious leaders that salvation comes only through Jesus. This is soteriological exclusivity. This simply means that salvation is in no one else but Jesus. The way of salvation is a narrow way. Luke's audience, Luke's audience would have understood exactly what Luke was writing, these non-Christians. And when they heard this, this exclusive nature of salvation, they would have not liked it. And it's the same in our day. Non-Christians who hear this truth that salvation comes only through Jesus. They don't like that message, the exclusivity of it. In verse 11, because Jesus is the cornerstone that was rejected by the builders and now the essential part of the building that God is constructing, every person must acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the only way to be made right with God. Jesus Christ, there's no one else. Now, this is a hard statement for us to take in this pluralistic society. Because what are you saying, Russell? You're saying that sincere people of other faiths can't be made right with God? That there is no other way to be saved? That's exactly what I'm saying. See, history has had many saviors. History shows us that there have been many people who have, who have been savior figures, and humanity has devised many ways of salvation. But there is no other human that has been able to save and no other method has worked. In order to be saved, one must have faith in the name. What name? The name of Jesus Christ. That's the only way salvation comes. We can't manufacture salvation on our own apart from Jesus. He has done it, not us. Now, the fact that you may live a better life than others uh, that you may have more degrees, uh, that you don't drink or cuss. Uh, the fact that you have, may have a better life than the person next to you does not mean that you are able to make yourself fit for heaven. That only comes by grace. So suppose three men decided that they wanted to swim to Hawaii. And one of the men swam farther than the other two. Now, that man who was in the front can't boast about anything because in the end, all three die. All three of them die because Hawaii is just too far to swim to in one day or in one trip. My friends, God is too high, too holy for us to even on our best days make ourselves acceptable to him. Salvation comes only through Jesus Christ and that by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, for you are saved by grace through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. 
you're, you nor I can come to God with anything in our hands to say, see what I have done. You must accept me. Because Isaiah would say everything that we bring is filthy rags. And no other religions are sufficient either. Peter didn't proclaim pluralism. He proclaimed exclusivism. We even have some theologians that don't believe in the absolute uniqueness of Jesus. They see him as on par with other leaders of other faiths. However, Jesus is not on par with the founders of other religions. He is greater. Also, the faith that we have is not equal and the same as other faiths universally in our world. No one can be saved outside of Jesus Christ. There are no other means offered to humanity other than the explicit belief in Jesus as he is offered in the Gospels. So Jesus is the only means of salvation. And finally, Jesus was put to death unjustly, but God reversed the verdict. It says in verse 10, Peter said, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. My friends, we have an indescribable gift in Jesus. Indescribable. Think about it. We have a Savior who died for us. And God gave his only son for us. John 3, 16, that many of us know, if you don't know it, this is what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. That verse even speaks of the exclusivity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the person who believes in him, Jesus, will not perish but have eternal life. See, the religious leaders put put uh, Peter and John on trial because a lame man was healed. This lame man was healed by placing faith in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, Peter said to them. Crucifixion. Now, crucifixion was the most shameful and painful form of execution known in their day. To put somebody to death by crucifixion, ah, that was horrible. It was slow torture. It was reserved for low-class criminals. Now, Jesus crucified outside of Jerusalem by the Romans was an almost indisputable historical fact. History has let us know that Jesus was crucified outside of Jerusalem. And early Christians would not have invented crucifixion. Right? It brought horror to those who witnessed it. The irony here is that the sinless one died as a criminal, being crucified. He died as a sinner. Again, Peter informed them, these religious leaders, that they crucified Jesus. They were the instruments by which Jesus was crucified. But when we look at scripture, Jesus going to the cross has always been God's plan. This is God's doing. And we can see this in Isaiah chapter 53. I'm going to highlight verses 9 through 12. Isaiah wrote, he was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Hear that again. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days, and by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as spoil. Because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Again, this was the Lord's doing. Jesus being crucified. The father crushed his son. Isaiah says after his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. After he crushed his son, God raised him from the dead with all power and authority. Now, 
because this event was so horrible, if you look at the Gospels, uh, the Gospel writers don't describe all of the details of the crucifixion. They highlight that he was crucified, that he died, was buried and raised from the dead. The reason uh, during that day, people just did not write details about the crucifixion because it was such a horrible event. But the disciples wrote about the crucifixion. Why? Because of resurrection. They didn't mind writing about the crucifixion because Jesus had been raised from the dead. In raising Jesus from the dead, God began the process of renewal and restoration that will culminate in a transformed creation and the resurrection of all believers to eternal life. And what happened to the lame man was an anticipation of the glory to come, but it was also a sign of the present heavenly authority of the exalted Christ to save in the ultimate sense. My friends, without a resurrection, we have no hope, no hope. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 17, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. But praise be to God, Jesus is not in the grave. He is not dead. He was raised from the dead. God reversed the verdict of him as sinner by raising him up, declaring him and showing him to be righteous. And for that, you and I always ought to always praise him. When we go shopping, when we purchase anything, the person at the cash register gives us a receipt. We are given a receipt because if there's a problem with our purchase, if there are questions about what we have, we just pull out the receipt that proves that payment was made in full. For Christians bought by the blood of Christ, the payment of salvation was paid in full on Friday night when Jesus was crucified on the cross. Jesus died, was put in a tomb, a borrowed tomb. But early on Sunday morning, the receipt was given. The resurrection of Jesus is our receipt that God reversed the verdict of Jesus being a criminal. His resurrection is the receipt that Christ paid the price for you and for me. Because of what Jesus has done, my friends, we have eternal security. This gospel that we believe, that salvation is in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And if you don't know Jesus today, I pray that you would trust him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for Jesus. Father, thank you for giving the Lord Jesus for us in our place for our sins. But we worship and praise you because you raised him from the dead three days later. Lord, this is the message. This is what we must believe if we want to be made right with you. By your spirit, open the eyes of those whose eyes are closed. Change the hearts of those who have hearts of stones and give them a heart of flesh. Glorify your name. May we see a great harvest of people coming into your kingdom. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.